Peace and blessings, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Old Pass Podcast, aka the OP Podcast. And yes, OP is short for overpowered, and that is not because I am overpowered, but it is He, the Most High God, who is overpowered. Thank you for joining me. I am your host, Brother Reggie Page, and uh, we are going to continue with Cain. Um, and this story is going to be the next prose from Gene Toomer's Cain, which is called Becky. The story opens up with this. Becky was a white woman who had two Negro sons. She's dead. They've gone away. The pines whisper to Jesus. The Bible flaps its leaves with an aimless rustle on her mound. Here, we are already given a description of who Becky is and what this story might be about. First, we know that Becky was a white woman who is now dead. Two, she had two Negro sons, and my add, during this time of the 20th century, therefore making Becky a taboo. Third, after her death, her two Negro sons went away. That is unknown for the time being why they went away. But fourth, Becky's grave is in the wilderness amongst the Georgia Pines, and the Bible is on her grave, and the pages are flipping aimlessly already i just want to focus on the phrase aimless rustle because i believe this is a good metaphor of who becky might be aimless means wandering from place to place having no settled home so if i was to make my assumption based on the first few lines i would think that becky and her community was almost a woman without a country due to her life which was a social taboo a white woman having two Negro sons, meaning she engaged in a interracial relationship. Now, there are some questions that I need to be answered, which are first, were these Negro sons biological or adopted? Second, why have or keep these sons knowing the possible social ostracization? Third, was Becky a social outcast in the Georgia community that she lived in? And fourth, if so, what was the social consequences? And with these questions in mind, let's dive deeper into the short story, Becky. So the narrator of the story talks about Becky when she had her first Negro son. It caused a commotion from the so-called whites in the towns and the so-called black folks uh, who followed along. When the people of the town tried to figure who was Becky's baby daddy, all we know is that he was a Negro. Other than that, Becky, and I quote, wouldn't tell who the baby daddy was. The story then takes a gothic turn. The story states that after being ridiculed by the white townsfolks, Becky was so vexed by their words and eventually, quote unquote, broke, or in layman's turn, I believe had a mental breakdown. As a result of her interracial relationship and her silence of who her Negro baby daddy was, the whole town casted her out of the town. The white folks wanted nothing to do with her, and the black folks followed suit. But I guess they had some decency to at least build her a cabin before casting her and her Negro sons out of the town. As it is written, it states this, White folks and black folks built her cabin, fed her, and her growing baby prayed secretly to God who put his cross upon her and cast her out. Ridiculous. The cabin was located on a narrow strip of land between the railroad and the road. Uh, the home was a single room cabin with a leaning chimney. Six trains, six trains passed by each day along the traffic on the road. Now, here is the most eerie and sad thing that the people I believe that the people did to her and I quote train men and passengers who heard about her threw out papers and food threw out little crumpled slips of paper scribbled with prayers as they passed her eye shaped piece of sandy ground ground island eyes between the road and railroad track pushed up where blue sheen god with listless eyes could look at it ten folks from the town took turns unknown of course to each other in bringing corn and meat and sweet potatoes. Even sometimes snuff, 
Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, David Georgia, grinding cane and boiling syrup, never went her way without some sugar sap. No one ever saw her. Now, this had to be a most undesirable situation. For one, to be casted out in a isolated wood, yet a noisy and busy part of the woods where one would probably have trouble sleeping, right, um, due to the train tracks. Secondly, the people casting her out also had the weird de decency to bring her food and throw her prayers. Uh, though the passerby of the people never saw Becky come out of the house, right, um, they did see her son carrying another baby. However, when it came to Becky's whereabouts, the town folks assumed that she was dead. However, they never really know because they were afraid to ask the sons about it. What we read about the sons is that they were, quote unquote, sullen and cunning. And I believe the reason the narrator describes them as such is because of this line. And I quote, no one dared ask. They beat and cut a man who meant nothing at all in mentioning that they lived along the road, white or colored. No one knew, and least of all themselves. They drifted from job to job. We, who had cast out their mother because of them, could we take them in? They answered black and white folks by shooting up two men and leaving town. So, while they left town, they cursed both the whites and the blacks of that town. Now, the town changed their former assumptions from thinking that Becky was dead to believing that she was alive because smoke actually began to come from her chimney, even though her sons were long gone. Of course, the townsfolk thought it in goodwill to start bringing her food and prayers again. Unfortunately, they ended up quitting that good deed because they were overcome with fear of the cabin and the leaning chimney and its eerie aura. The story ends with the narrator talking about being with his church on Sunday and they were passing by Becky's cabin. Now, on this day, it seemed very eerie and peculiar as it was an autumn day. Um, no wind was blowing, yet their horses started to freak out when they were close to Becky's house. A train or, as I quote, ghost train passed by and Becky's chimney fell in. The narrator and a man named Barlow, who actually comes up in another story um, in Cain, both go into the cabin, but they don't see Becky. They assume that Becky might be under the pile of bricks, and Barlow throws a Bible on the mound or pile of bricks that might be on top of Becky's body. However, we ultimately don't know. After all of that, the narrator actually goes back into town just to tell the town folks what just happened. And that is how the story Becky ends. So here are my thoughts. First, I just wanted to cover one of the main themes that goes into this story. The first one is the topic of interracial relationships. One thing we must keep in mind is that during this time in America, interracial relationships were illegal. And I say that because the way the town, both the blacks and whites, treated Becky was horrific due to the fact that she had interracial relationships with a so-called black man. This makes me ponder on the reality of people during that time in America and how they had to move if they were engaging in, in, a, in a, excuse me, interracial relationships. Howbeit, I will say this, things have changed for the better, but even today, being in an interracial relationship, it still has a social tabooness to it, to many folks in, even in America today. And sadly, the children who were born out of interracial relations tend to be innocent bystanders of a choice they had no parts of. I'm not saying that interracial relationships are wrong, but I can't help but to think that the serious questions to consider when you actually choose a spouse of another ethnicity. And how crucial it is to raise those quote unquote mixed race children to not hold grudges towards whatever ethnicity each of their parents come from, especially if those ethnicities or cultures view that interrelationships is a not only a social taboo, but a social sin. But going to my main thoughts of the story, the interesting thing of off the back is that Becky does not speak one word in this story. 
The narrator that speaks in this story seems to be a person from the town that casted Becky out. When it came to Becky, when she was condemned and judged by the townsfolks for having children out of wedlock and having relations with a so-called black man as a so-called white woman. When you read diligently the language of the narrator who, be, who I believe represents the culture of the town, he constantly prays to Jesus in between many of the sentences of the story. Which causes me to think that the town is a little less than Nineveh and more of how religious Israel acted in the scriptures and even today. Though Becky committed a social taboo or a social sin, people in the town still took care of her in secret. Yet, they were still from afar. This shows me that the people in the town had some type of conviction from casting out Becky and her son. But the fact that they did these works, these good works, but these works in secret, also shows that the people of the town were more worried about being accepted within their society rather than accepting Becky and her choice to have interracial relations. Because of their hypocrisy, instead of actually caring and having compassion towards Becky, instead they treated her and her sons like an animal in the zoo that they built for their own amusement and safety. And when you read, the town folks were afraid to even talk to her and her sons. And Becky's sons, as a result, in my opinion, hated the town, both the whites and the blacks, that casted them out for no godly reason. Becky was the scapegoat of her community. Becky was the black sheep of her community. She was the runt of the litter of her community. We do not know why Becky chose to have relations with someone of a different ethnicity, but because of that choice, we know that she was the outcast that the townsfolks casted their sins upon and she suffered. And how do we know that she suffered? I look at how her sons turned out as murderers and they clearly held a grudge towards the town before they left the town themselves. A sad truth is that when people don't understand someone or understand someone's taste in certain things, they feel the need to cast them out. In fact, in society, we are taught that the black sheep is a bad person in society that needs to be casted out. Think of it like this. Sometimes people have children for the wrong reasons. People who do these things for the wrong reasons might have some need that they want to fulfill within themselves that doesn't actually serve the child. Therefore, the child is born with a unique set of needs, wants, priorities, preferences, opinions, and this child is not given much consideration for any of these things and life is just naturally hard for them from the very beginning. If they want to assert who they are, this child has to do it by force, and this action is not usually received well by others. It is as if this child is a thing that is brought out when it's convenient or put away when it's convenient like a toy or something. Like a toy, this child or this thing is expected to think, do, and act in a way that is convenient for the parent, or in this story, Becky is to act in a way that is more convenient for the town and the townsfolk. But because this child is a unique human being that was born with its own separate identity, how long do you think it will have been before the problem starts? In childhood, this child will conform to the wishes, thinking, and the sets of values of the parents in order to stay close to the parents and maintain a sense of belonging with the rest of the family. The child finding his or her true self or identity or the way God made them might become a painful process since so many contrary ideas have been projected onto them. Make no mistake that this child is a child that understands things differently. This is the child that understands that there might be something that is very seriously wrong within this family. This is the child that tends to be very discerning and sees the truth of the members of their family. And as a whole, this is the child that has learned to see through a lot of the things in the world. This child lives outside the box and is able to view the world in a unique perspective because of that. This is the black sheep. 
And the black sheep are very special people who we need a lot more of in the world. The black sheep of the family is the member of the family that has been singled out for being different, usually in a negative way. To many people, to the world, and to the rest of the sheep or the rest of the fish that just goes with the flow, view the black sheep as a problem child, as the one who rocks the boat and challenges the status quo. Hence, the town viewed Becky as the problem child, the one who challenged the status quo. There is a certain dynamic at play here. This makes the black sheep the runt of the litter. Any animal that has a litter can give birth to a runt. The runt of a litter is any animal that is usually a little smaller below the natural or usual size of the species and perceived as weak by the rest of the litter. This little one would often face rejection by the rest of its litter mates and sometimes even by its own mother. Runts in the wilderness usually has a less chance of surviving since they are usually left out to die and usually has a better chance of surviving and actually persevering if it becomes domesticated. But if they do survive in the wilderness, it is because they usually had to fight harder to get mother's milk. They had to fight harder for mother's love. They had to fight harder for everything and had to endure what we may call either physical or emotional abuse. They had to squeeze their way in when they were being pushed aside. So what does that mean? It means that this little runt is actually not as weak as folks made it out to be. Sadly, the runt will still continue to face rejection in diverse degrees from the rest of this family. So after they're weaned, they strike out on their own. They'll explore the world on their own, and by this, they learn to be good at being alone. They will always view the world differently than their litter mates, whom, in contrast, will identify strongly with the family or group identity. The runt will learn to think independently of his group. He will develop the intelligence that runts are famous for. Those who ever bought a puppy, many would choose the runt of the litter because the runt, as claimed, is the smartest out of all the others. And the truth is that the runt is the smartest out of the bunch because its unique life circumstances has taught it early life lessons that the rest of his litter mates either learn way later in life or, sadly, never at all. There are runts within human families, and they are called the black sheep. This is the child that gets a little bit rejected by the family because he or she doesn't quite conform within the standards that were set by the family. Because of this, they are perceived as not only the black sheep, but the lost sheep, the troublemaker, the rebel, or even the weird kid, the peculiar one. In the Christian circles, the peculiar ones are the peculiar pilgrims. They are perceived as weak less intelligent, and having the less chance to succeed and thrive. And sadly, this can be true because of the psychological abuse the child had to face where they grow up to think that they are the bad kids and they are going to amount to nothing. They're obsolete and may have to go to therapy to sort that mindset out. And when we look at Becky in this short story, she never had a chance because not only did the town not want her, but the laws of the land built her up to be the runt of the litter. And the damage was done to her and her children as the ending of Becky and her son's stories was tragedy. But going back to the black sheep in general, the revelation would be is that this child would be the one to see the truth in many things. They were the ones who that was forced to step back and analyze the situation for what it really is because they were forced to the outside. And this person, the black sheep, is the one who was forced into the wilderness and most likely learned to look at everything with a different perspective. This is the one that is most likely to see the truth when others don't. And since they're the ones that dealt with the unpleasantness of isolation, they tend to have no problem seeing and accepting an uncomfortable and inconvenient and or negative truth as well. Unpleasant situations isn't hard for the black sheep. 
Now, this does not mean they prefer it, but it isn't hard for them. As we can tell, even after the town forcibly isolated Becky from the town into the wilderness, Becky actually had another child. The black sheep is not the weakest member of the group. And if the black sheep is in the right environment, it tends to be the shining soul. From their forced isolation and rejection, they formed a keen sense of identity, a keen sense of self. They develop a brand of intelligence others have trouble understanding. As they watch the world from the sidelines, they learn to think outside the box because they were thrown outside of that box as soon as they were born. They view everything at a different angle from the rest, and this gives them a keen advantage in the process of thought. They weren't rejected because they were weak. Black sheep, like Becky, were rejected because they were strong enough that they didn't conform. And to the black sheep, conforming means denying the truth, and they were not going to deny the truth. Therefore, they were a threat to the status quo. Hence, I will ask you this, listeners. Do you love truth or do you love the status quo? The black sheep are the ones who will shine the light on truth because they are not afraid of being isolated since they've been isolated by force all their lives. If the black sheep can manage to keep their strong system themselves not and not fall into the snares of giving up their identity in exchange for closeness with people who don't really give a hoot in hell about them, they can be the greatest teachers this world has ever seen on this side of heaven. No one sees the contrast of life more than the black sheep. No one sees the flaws and inconsistencies more than the black sheep. And if you are a black sheep, understand that you have a special calling. The black or the black sheep does not mean dark, evil. It means you are different, distinct. The black sheep is never meant to blend in, but to stand out. God designed the black sheep to stand out for a reason. The black sheep was taught by life to see things in a different way. And that is a God-given gift that many don't have. And that is what I ultimately learned from Gene Toomer's Becky. Becky, the white woman who had two Negro sons, was the black sheep of her town. And Becky was strong enough not to conform during a time where it was illegal to have interracial relations. And though the town acted religious and acted as if they loved the Most High God, they actually feared the people more than they feared the Most High God. And if God could accept that black sheep Becky and her two Negro sons, then shame on those cowardly people who casted the stone despite actively sinning in the act. And hey, that's just a low down gospel truth. Thank you for watching. And I do really recommend that you read Cain by Gene Toomer. It is a incredible read, and I believe it is one of the best books, um, at least top five books that I recommend. But if you enjoyed this episode, please do like, comment, and subscribe, and share the knowledge with your folks and kin folks. Throw in a love offering in the Cash App, which is in the uh, description below. And remember this, the truth shall make you free. May the God of all knowledge have mercy and grace upon you all. Peace.